quick. <laughs> I'm Bob Darrow and I am alcoholic. <laughs> Never mind. Um, there's several of us up here. Uh, I'd like to thank, I, and first of all, I'm <laughs> sober through the grace of God and Alcoholics Anonymous since Halloween 1978. I'd like to thank Al and the members of the committee for inviting me to come here and talk three times. I mean, there's, I don't even think I would listen to, I, Clancy's the only one I might listen to three times in one weekend. And, and that's just because I'd be sucking up. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I, it, it's, it's, it, I, it's an honor to be here, it really is. And what's even, I think, more of an honor is I got needled by Clancy from the podium last night, which puts me in a, in a fellowship within our fellowship. I think we should have our own conference, but we wouldn't want to overshadow the international. Of, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I want to welcome the people that are new. I'm glad you're here. And I, I, I only am concerned with two people to, that I want to talk to that I think my experience is useful for. And that first person is the man and woman that for some reason you can't seem to get a foothold here. You try and you make up your mind and you're never going to touch that stuff again and you mean it. And seven or eight months later you're back at it again. And it's really getting old. And you don't know how much longer you can go like this in and out of AA. I'm, I'm here to talk to you because you are me. I, I was seven and a half years relapsing. As a matter of fact, the absolute most horrific, painful years of my life came after I came to my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous. In the following seven years, I, I don't think there's, there's a hell, anything, a hell worse than needing Alcoholics Anonymous and being right in the middle of Alcoholics Anonymous and not connecting with Alcoholics Anonymous. I don't think there's anything worse than that. And there's a loneliness uh, about that, um, that I know exactly what that's about. I know what it feels like to be surrounded by people that are recovering and then there's you. Uh, and uh, that's, I know that. And then the other person I'm here to talk to is the man or woman that Maybe you're leaving AA and you don't even know you're, you're leaving it. You're leaving it maybe by one judgment at a time or one compromised action at a time. And the level of involvement in your own recovery at maybe a year sober is, was maybe three times what it is today because you've gotten weller and weller and weller. And you don't even, need, you don't even know you're compromising your medicine. Um, I'm here for you uh, one of the hardest things I've had to do in Alcoholics Anonymous has been to survive myself. There's only one person in this room that doesn't want me here, and it's me. There's only one person here that's ever tried to judge my way out of here or compromise my way out of here, and it's been me. And I've been very, very lucky through good sponsorship, through uh, commitments in Alcoholics Anonymous that I showed up for even when I didn't want to. And I did sometimes not for, for noble reasons. Sometimes I did it because I didn't want to be talked bad about if I didn't show up. Um, but through all of those things and staying tethered I, to you, I've been able to survive myself here. And, and I, I am happy to say that if you were to come to Las Vegas where I live and you were to watch me over the course of a week, I believe that you would see a guy who's just as involved, who looks like he's just as involved in Alcoholics Anonymous as I was my first couple of years. Uh, I don't think I've, comp I've changed the game plan. Um, and I'm glad for that. Um, I, I suspect that I've had alcoholics, I've had al alcoholism for as far back as I can remember. I think I had it before I ever picked up a drink. I, I must have been like a freeze-dried alcoholic waiting for alcohol. And, and the reason I think that is that I was a little weird, even when as a little kid. I, I was very full of myself. My mother used to tell me that. I never knew what she meant till after I got sober. She'd say, Rob, you're just full of yourself. I didn't know what she was talk talking about. But I just seemed to feel like I was the center of the universe. And everything had to do with me. 
And I always seemed to be that way. And I had a, 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 an inability, uh, as a, even as a kid, to fit. And it's, it's not that I wasn't popular, and it's not that I didn't run around with a gang of, of guys. I did. But I never felt connected to them the way they so easily seemed to be connected to each other. And there was all, I always felt like I was coming from behind. And when I was 12, almost 13 years old, this malady of my being, this thing that's not quite right, uh, was touched for the first time by alcohol, an event that, unbeknownst to me, would change the course of my life. And I wasn't conscious of that. But basically, I got, the first time I ever got drunk, what it, really what happened is it made me feel so good that the way I would be without that effect from that moment on would never be enough again for me. And without even realizing it, getting lit up just kind of moved right into the center of my life. It seemed like from that moment on, I just existed between opportunities to party. And it became the most important thing in my life. I, I wasn't conscious of that. If you would have asked me at different times, is, is, is that the most important thing? I said, no, school was, or the job was, or the relate. But if you would have watched my actions, you'd watched a guy who just went along, and then got, then when he started to party, got lit up, and it was the only time he seemed like he was really happy. And then I would get sober again. And in, in the early days of drinking, in the, in the years that the hook is set, and I think all of us have those years, because if, if, if there's not a time where alcohol did something magical for you, in later years you're not going to hang in there and let it do to you what it's going to do to you eventually. If you're not, if it did one time didn't do something for you. And what it did for me was it, it freed me from the bondage of self. A guy who's so locked up in his head that doesn't fit very well. Uh, five or six drinks, I could come out and play. I could talk to people. I could dance. I could shoot pool better than I could ever shoot pool. I could dance. And I can't dance, but I'd get drunk, man. I can dance. I mean, I'm... I just feel the rhythm of the universe moving through me, man. I'm just, wow. And I, and I could be funny. I'm not funny, but about half drunk, I was funny. I could see the comic stuff in the universe and just comment on it, you know. And I could be deep and intellectual and philosophical. I remember one time with a bunch of guys were smoking stuff and drinking wine and Cracking the secrets of the universe, you know, just, just like you get that point where you think, ah, oh, this is what Buddha saw, you know, just, just get, oh. and then I sober up and I'm back to being me, and I never liked that much, and I think that was my big secret, is that I always liked myself better when I was lit up and. And even through the years that it turned on me and it got bad, I think I still preferred myself when I was drunk over the way I preferred myself when I was sober. And I got a progressive disease. And I'm 15, almost 16 years old, and I'm standing before a juvenile court judge for the third time. And if you would have asked me why I was there, I, I, could have to, I would have told you unfair police and bad luck and a snitch. and all. I would have told you all kinds of stuff. But the real reason that I'm there is that I have an allergic reaction to alcohol that I'm not aware of. And what happens is when I go out to party with my friends, I have an inability to shut her down when you should. I always take her to the wall. I always go a little too far. And for some reason, when I'm about half whacked, there's some stuff that seems like a good idea that's really not a good idea. Man. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a blackout drinker. I'm a blackout drinker as a young teenager. Any blackout drinkers in here? Yeah. Oh, yeah. My people. Uh, it's hard going through life when other people know more about you than you do. It's, uh, <laughs> you know, and, and I, I never did anything good in a blackout. Nobody ever came up to me the next day and said, Bob, you were so helpful at the party last night. <laughs> I heard horrific, horrific things. You, you peed in our kitchen. <laughs> you threw up on my living room rug, you sideswiped my car, you 
hit on my wife, you stole my stash, you broke my lamp. The absolute worst one I've ever heard. I ran into this guy, I'm shaking and I need a drink. And I'm, I'm about 20 years old, 21 years old, I guess. And I'm on my way to the liquor store that was just getting ready to open in about a half hour. And I need a drink real bad. I run into this guy in the street and he says, Do you know you told everybody at the party last night you beat Bruce Lee in a karate match? <laughs> I just want to crawl under a rock, you know. I, so I'm a young kid. I'm, I'm in trouble. I'm, I'm not even 16 years old yet, and I'm standing before this juvenile court judge because when I start to drink, something happens to me that doesn't happen to everybody. It only happens to people with the disease of alcoholism. It doesn't happen to non-alcoholics, and what that is is that when I start to feel the effect from alcohol, it lights something up inside of me that just can't get enough of that. And it's always more, more, more. You know, non-alcoholics never get that. If you've ever watched a, a non-alcoholic drink, I, my sister's not an alcoholic. I've watched my sister drink many occasions. I've really, I watch her like a cat will watch a guy eat a tuna fish sandwich. I mean, I watch, I look in her eyes. I want to see the effect and everything. And it's the weirdest deal. My sister, who's not an alcoholic, when she gets about two drinks in her, and you can see that she's starting to feel a little bit of that glow in her normal, healthy, non-alcoholic wiring. She goes, whoa, whoa, whoa. <laughs> and she shuts her right down. It, it's inconceivable for her to get knee-walk and cry baby drunk. And she just would never do that. I mean, she just won't go that far. It, 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 never. And yet, as an alcoholic, in my alcoholic wiring, as the two drinks start to hit me, it lights something up inside of me that just demands more of that feeling. And I, I can't get enough. Uh, there's a test in the big book. Um, it's a way they say you can diagnose yourself if you're not sure if you have that. It, they, in 1939, they recommended the test. Matter of fact, I remember in the 1970s watching, watching an old timer in a meeting talking to a new guy who doesn't think he's an alcoholic and shoving money in the guy's hand and says, here, go find out. Uh, I wouldn't do that. I, I wouldn't even recommend the test. I think it's a, it's a kind of a shaky test because you're asking a guy to go and try some controlled drinking, try to drink and stop abruptly. Well, it, if you have the chronic mind of an alcoholic as I do, it's not a very viable test because if I'm going to go take the test, let's say I'm going to go down here to this bar and I'm going to go in, I'm going to have two drinks, that's it, shut her down, can't smoke nothing, take nothing, 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 two drinks, that's it. Well, about halfway through that second drink, it's going to become very apparent to me that this is a bad test day. <laughs> Because there'd be a ball game on. The game is on. Oh, my God, I didn't know I'd have to watch it. Got, there'd be some guy there I'd see, or some girl. I'd have a drink with her. There'd be always an absolute reasonable, legitimate reason to have another drink. And I don't understand that the phenomenon of craving, the allergic reaction to alcohol within me, is using my own mind against me and all my abilities to rationalize and justify so that the next drink now seems appropriate. And I think it's my idea. I don't know that I'm being driven by a craving that my mind will justify, do anything it can to justify so that the next drink seems like it's appropriate. And I'm standing before this judge, and my, I'm almost 16 years old. My parents who loved me. I didn't come from an alcoholic home. My, my parents were good, good people. And they were trying to help me at that point. I years later beat that out of them. At that point, they would have done anything to help me. I, I, and they went to bat with the judge and trying to keep me from getting locked up at this place that was really bad for teenagers that had a bad reputation. And I had to go live somewhere else instead for a while, and I, uh, it was the deal they made, and the, I went to this new place to live, and I'm not even there a, a week, and I meet this older kid, he's one of the hip guys there, and, and I start talking to him about my um, trouble I'm in, and the gang of guys I run around with, and what we do, and everything, and he, he says to me, he says, so, uh, you like to party, do you? And I said, yes, I do. 
He said, well, you drink that liquor. That liquor will make you stupid. I said, oh, man, I don't know. I love that. I, at that time, I was really infatuated with 151 rum because that will get you downtown now. I mean, real, that's just that stuff would just light me up, man, like Las Vegas on the 4th of July. Man, I just love that stuff. And he says to me, he says, you're always in trouble. He says, what if, what if I told you I could give you something that might, might make you feel that good? Maybe better, and they won't be able to smell it on your breath. It won't make you slur your words. You won't stagger. Nobody will even know you're high, and you can keep a whole week supplying your shirt pocket. What would you say to that? I don't even know what he's talking about, but sign me up. I mean, and, and, and he introduces me to drugs, and I've got to tell you, I'm an alcoholic. Alcoholics should not do drugs. It's bad. <laughs> oh, man. It's a... Because I do drugs alcoholically. I'm trying to reproduce an effect I got on a pint of 151 rum. And I do it obsessively. And, and in no time at all I'm doing amphetamines. And I don't just do them. I'm doing it where guys that have been doing it for seven and eight years are saying, Kid, you better cool it. I, I, I turn myself into just in a couple months into the guy who, if you left me alone in your car when, to go get cigarettes, when you came back, I've dismantled your dashboard looking for microphones from the FBI, right? I've, like, turned myself into some kind of paranoid schizophrenic. A, a guy comes along and he, he says, man, you're really messed up. And I, Because I couldn't even have conversations anymore. I'd be standing around a bunch of guys talking, and I'd blurt something into the conversation that would have been very appropriate three minutes ago, right? <laughs> and this guy says to me, he says, you're really screwed up. Try some of this. And he injects me with this stuff that, well, when the throwing up stopped, I could think straight. My head stopped spinning. He introduced me to heroin. But I'm an alcoholic. We shouldn't do drugs. It was bad. I did that alcoholically for a little while. And... And I threw some other stuff to come full circle back to alcohol. And I, I suspect that my dance of death with drugs, with, I think I did drugs for the same reason that Dr. Bob did. Uh, Dr. Bob did high-powered sedatives, according to his story, every day of his life for 17 years. And what it did is it bought him periods of abstinence. And, and, and an illusion of, 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 of feeling a little, little bit better and a little bit more in control. Uh, but every single time Dr. Bob picked up a drink, he drank like I did. He, he'd just get whacked. I mean, for God's sakes, the, the day Bill Wilson tried to see him, he couldn't see him because he was taking a nap under the dining room table. I mean, you've got to love a guy like that. You know, I'm that guy. I'm the guy. I, I, I was just telling, we were, I was talking to a, a guy last night about, I, I played in a couple bands, little dinky neighborhood kind of stuff we'd play elk we'd play bars little local bars vfw halls that kind of thing and i was the guy that if the band leader didn't find me some kind of diet pills or something i was taking a nap in a booth by the second set because they give the band free drinks and you can't do that to me because i can't get enough i can't get enough and I'm that kind of I'm that kind of drinker. I I'm the kind of guy that if I'm still conscious, I ain't done drinking. And it's always been true for me. I remember being in a party up in Boston on spring break, and somebody gave me some kind of weird pills. I, it's funny looking back. I didn't even ask them what they were. Just said thank you, <laughs> right? And and whatever they were. They immobilized me, and I'm, I think they were some kind of animal tranquilizer. I'm laying on the ground. My mind is just fully awake. My body can't move, and I'm laying there trying to talk people into bringing me a drink, right? Because <laughs> that's the kind of alcoholic I am. When I start, I, I just go, man. I just go. So I, I went to my first treatment center, uh, and my first, consequently, my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous as a young kid. I wasn't uh, quite old enough to even take a legal drink yet. And I went to this meeting. I didn't want to go. I, 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 I thought it was bunk. I didn't know AA sounded weird to me. One of my best, and it, it felt awkward coming in here and being here, like it, the feeling like it's come to this, has it? Alcoholics Anonymous. One of my, the best descriptions of coming to AA that I, I connected with, with was, a guy, Joe McQueenie, who just died, I heard him say this years ago, 
he said as a musician, he said it felt like he joined the Salvation Army band. Uh, you know, that's what it, it kind of felt like that to me. It's like alcohol. Oh man, and the people were old. They were 35, 40, 50 years old. Their life was over for God's sakes. I'm a young kid. I I have hope. I'm not an alcoholic of the hopeless variety. I got hope. I think that even the bad luck I've had recently, I'm going to turn this around. I, I suspect the good days are ahead of me. Little did I know that I was in the grip of a progressive illness that over, the book says, over any considerable period gets worse and ever better. Those little rough bumps in the road I'd seen, I'll tell you, were nothing compared to what was coming ahead. And one of the, the one of the horrible things about this progressive progressive illnesses of alcoholism, you know, is it gets worse and it gets worse and it gets worse and you get to a point where you don't care and you leave everything go and it gets really, really bad. And then the worst thing it gets to a point sometimes where you think to yourself, it can't get any worse. And it gets worse. And then the worst of all, it gets the same. And I entered into those last years of drinking the the desperate drinking, the drinking trying to blot it out because there's no more party left in it anymore. And I'd come to on some guy's couch and I, I'm sick and I'm shaking and I'm trying to see if I have enough change for a bottle of Richard's Wild Irish Rose. And, you know, I'm putting, trying to put something together. Not, not for, this is not partying anymore. The magic days are gone. This is bleak. This is pathetic feel sorry for myself, crying jag, uh, depressive, don't bathe anymore because I don't care about nothing drinking. There's no party left in this. And that was the way the last several years of my drinking was. And yet, in spite of that, and this is the, the, this perception thing of, the, of my mind is so weird because you get me in a halfway house Six months sober, and, and I will start feeling so uncomfortable sober that I will start imagining that I can drink like I drank when I was 18 years old again. And I will imagine that in the face of the last five or six times I tried it. I couldn't, and that's my reality, but I don't like that reality. Our book refers to that as self-delusion. It's a, it's a psychotic-like wishful thinking. It's the party's over, but I don't want it to be over so desperately that I will imagine that it's not until I start believing it. And I will bet my life that on the illusion. And I, that's the last couple of years were like that. It was, it was, it was bad. I, uh, in and out of places, I didn't live. I really had nowhere to live. I, I, if I wasn't in a halfway house or some guy's couch or a detox or in a county jail or somewhere, I never had an address through all those years. And you know something? I never once thought of myself as a homeless guy. I kind of fancied myself as an urban outdoorsman in the Jack Kerouac spirit, you know. <laughs> kind of a, you know, a bohemian kind of eccentric um, with wine sores <laughs> and wet pants. Uh, in uh, 1977, I, uh, I was in a halfway house in Pennsylvania, and I'd, I was sober. I, I used to, you know, I used to say close to a year. And I've thought about this and tried to figure out the timeline, and I think it was only really a couple few months that just seemed like a year. You know what I mean? Cause, you know, because if you're like me and you get sober and you're just not drinking and that's all you're doing... It's horrible. It, it feels if you're like me, abstinence feels like you're doing time, and it, it's just it just day after day, and this this oh it's bleak, and and I'm in this place, and I don't know what to do, and I'm I don't want to drink anymore. I'm not stupid. I've been in several treatment centers. I get what will happen. I understand by this point that. I have that thing in me that I can't start because once I once I pick up a drink, it's like 
It's like having sex with a gorilla. You're not done till the gorilla's done. It's just the way it is. And I know I'm that guy. I, I hadn't read the big book, so I didn't know the terminology, but I knew I, I can't do the first one. I can't let that thing out of the cage. But I can't hang. And I'm... Uh, Abstinence feels like I'm doing time and I suffer these low-level depressions and, and, and there's a loneliness about it. It's in a boredom about it. It's just, it's hard to put into words because you can't really tell anybody in AA you feel lonely because they're going to want you to go somewhere with a bunch of people you don't even like. You know, right? right? So you don't want to tell them that. It's because they don't understand, really. They don't really get it. Uh, and... Uh, I don't even get it. I went to an old timer one time in this, in this period, and I, I, was, I just felt bad. I just, I was so bored. I just, I said to him, I said, "What do you, you know, you now that you're sober? I mean, what do you do for fun?" And he says to me, he gets this big smile on his face. He says, "Oh, we go to a lot of meetings." <laughs> and I thought, "Ah, uh, ah, uh, man." You got What else do you do? Do anything? You got to do something else than just go to meetings. He said, "Oh yeah, twice a year we have an AA dance." <laughs> you ever been to an AA dance with untreated alcoholism? Oh my God! You remember why you used to drink quick? Because it, oh, it's <laughs> it's like you're standing against this wall and it's all of them and then there's you and it, oh man, it's awful. I can't imagine life like this. Any, it's. And I, it's, it's such a dilemma because I know that to drink is a bad deal. And I'm trying. I'm hanging in there as much as I can. You know, to me in those days, Alcoholics Anonymous seemed to have good news and bad news. The good news is, well, maybe if I went constantly to thousands of these meetings, I'd stay sober the rest of my life. And the bad news, I'm going to live a long time. See, I can't imagine life without something. I, I got my big secret. My big secret is I ain't no good. On the natch as is, this isn't any good for me, really. And it never was. And I had tried a lot of things. I had tried medications. I tried different types of therapy. I went to some week. I went to a Gestalt weekend where they wouldn't even let you sleep, and you just dealt with your feelings. I mean, it changed my life for two weeks. <laughs> I've had my life changed for two weeks many times. The problem is, I am always end up back to being me. And I can't change that. And I don't know what to do, and the alcohol is not working anymore, but I'm in this place, and I'm, I start getting these fantasies that maybe it would work again, and I, I call this guy up that I'd been in detox with, and he was back to drinking, and I suspected he was, and and he tells me about this bar he, he found down where he lives in a couple towns down and, and it, with a great bands and he had some, some tie stick and, and the great girls that are at this bar. And I'll tell you, I'm over ready for a good time. I have been a really good sport up to now. And I don't want to hurt myself and I don't want to hurt nobody. But my God, I'm entitled to like a weekend, for God's sakes, after all these months. You know, just to, just, just to go out and have a little fun with some guys, that's all. And I get a weekend pass and I'm, I'm still a victim of that delusion that, that under the right set of circumstances I could control and enjoy my drinking. I'm deluded enough to not see the reality of my drinking anymore. I think I'm going to be able to enjoy it like I enjoyed it when I was 18 years old in spite of the reality that that's been a dead horse for years now. And I think I could control it to some degree if I put my mind to it. Not that I'll get scot-free, but that I could keep the damage down to something reasonable. I'll be able to go out, party, come back to the halfway house, sort of like do a drive-by and come back, you know, <laughs> right? Because I'm deluded. I think that I can do that. And I go out and I'm, I meet, meet this guy and we're on our way to this bar and I am excited. I am lit up. The best part of that run and every run the last three years was the hour before it started. And then I get to the bar and I'm ordering those double shots with beer backs because I want to get there now. 
and I'm throwing them down waiting for the party to jump start because I'm seeing the guys that are having fun. And my God, I want to have some fun. And it ain't jump starting. All that's all that's in me is that gnawing for one more, one more. And as I'm starting to get a little a little bit drunk, I'm starting to feel sorry for myself. And I'm starting to sink into this deep, lonely depression as I look at everybody else having fun in the bar. And I remember, I remember sitting there looking at those people. There was some people dancing and there were guys and gals in the booths and people shooting pool in this other room. And I remember looking at all of them and just thinking, what's wrong with me? Because I had all that at one time. And I'd give anything to get that back. And it, it was like a window opened. And I think every once in a while you hear, hear people's stories where they talk about a moment of clarity or a moment of truth or whatever. But it was like a window opened. And all of a sudden, through all the delusion and the wishful thinking and all the fantasies and everything, I could see the truth. And the truth is, this is it. It's like that scene in the movie As Good As It Gets where, where Jack Nicholson's walking through the, the waiting room of his psychiatrist's office and everybody in there is a depressed mope and everybody just looks terrible and he stops and he says, gets their all attention. He says, what if this is as good as it gets? And they all go, oh no, no. And that's what it felt like to see the truth. It, it was horrible. And the reason it's horrible is because I can't imagine life with it now because this is terrible. This is it. This is pathetic. This is bad. And I can't imagine life without it either because abstinence ain't no good for me. And I feel stuck. And I, I never made it back uh, to the halfway house. I ended up in, in Beaver County Jail. Uh, Monday morning I came to there in a, in a cell and I was facing uh, some pretty heavy charges. Uh, probably going to end up, the guys, what they're telling me, I might be two years in a state penitentiary. They gave me a chance to call somebody for help, and there's nobody to call. I, I don't know how that happens to a guy who had a mother and father that would have done anything to help them, except that I just wore them out. And I don't know how that happens to a guy that had some great girlfriends and good running partners and and a lot of potential. I don't know how you get to be all alone where there's nobody to turn to except that they just get tired of you. And my, you know, my mother and father uh, loved me very much and they cut me out of their lives but they could never really cut me out of their heart. Um, my, my mother uh, took tranquilizers the last couple years that I was drinking and saw a therapist, and my father slept probably 15 or 16 hours a day because it broke their... They did what they had to do to survive, to cut me out of their life, but they couldn't cut me out of their heart. And I did that to them. Uh, I, I, I'm going to get a little sidetracked, but I'll tell you a little story. I, I always loved my parents, but I, I couldn't help but hurt them because of the disease of alcoholism, and I didn't know that. Um, I was living on this guy's couch in Reading, Pennsylvania, uh, and I'm sick, and I'm drinking the cheap wine round the clock if I can get it, if I can hustle enough money to get it. And I come to one morning, and I got enough change for a half gallon of Richard's Wild Irish Rose. And I, I'm the kind of guy at this point in my drinking where I come to, and I sit on the edge of the couch, and I grab myself, and I rock for a while, because I can't just, I've got to get up enough courage to get up and go out there, because I'm sick and I'm shaking. And I, I go out to this uh, state store and I get a, a jug of wine and I'm on my way back to the place to get lit up and I run into this woman on the street who knew my parents and she says to me, she says, uh, how's your dad? And I didn't know. I hadn't seen or talked to my father in a while. And she says to me, she says, I hear your dad's in the hospital and he's dying. And I didn't even know that. And I, I, I went, uh, took a big hit off that jug of wine and went to a phone booth and, and uh, called my mom up and she was not with everything that was going on with her she was not glad to hear from me and she had kind of like what do you want kind of a deal and I said I heard dad's in the hospital and, and he's not doing good and she said yeah yeah it's touch and go we don't know it's not good and I said to her I said mom I really want to come and see him 
And she said, I don't, I don't want you to come and see him. I said, Mom, I, I really want to come and see him. You see, I had a lot of unfinished business with my father, and the idea that he might die without me talking to him was just, man, it was too much to take. And she said, you can't see him, Rob. You know how, I know how you are, and it would hurt him to see you like you are. And I said, oh, well, I'll, I'll straighten up, Mom. I'll come in there. She said, listen, Rob, you can't fool him. You know how he is. He can tell if you've been drinking on the other end of the phone, and he could. Somehow he could just tell. I could just have a, just a couple drinks, not even drunk. Not, and he would know I was drinking somehow. He could, I don't know what it was, but he could tell. And she said, he'll know. And I said, I, I promise you, Mom, if you'll tell me where he is and if you'll say it's okay, I will sober up tomorrow and I'll come over there and I'll see him. And she said, you promise? I said, I promise. And she told me where he was in the hospital. He was in Reading Hospital. And I was going to go over there the next day. And the next morning I come to and I'm sitting on the edge of that couch and I'm shaking and I'm rocking back and forth and I've got to go see my dad. And the idea of, of walking over there, and now you've got to understand I've got hair down to about here and a beard and I'm not bathing and I don't, I'm sickly. And the idea of going over there and walking the way, I don't have any clean clothes, walking down those shiny quarters in that hospital with those people looking at me just terrifies me. And so I start talking to myself. And when an alcoholic starts having a conversation with himself, it's a bad deal, man, I'm telling you. And I start having this conversation with myself. Well, I'll, I'll get I'll get a half pint of vodka. You can't smell vodka on your breath. And just I ain't gonna get drunk. I just gotta take these shakes away. I can't go over there like this. It's too much. I can't do it. Just gotta take the shakes away. I'll eat some of those Hall's cough drops. I'll, my the guy I'm staying with has some of that Aramis cologne in his bathroom. I'll throw some of that on. Maybe use some of his Visine. Nobody will know. Just a little bit. Just a little bit. And I had enough money. I went to the liquor store, and I had enough money to get a fifth. Uh, and I'm not going to drink the fifth before I go there, but I want to have some for after I come back, right? Now, I'm in a bad spot and don't know it. And I start to drink just to, enough to take the edge off. The problem is I can't stop. And every drink I take justifies another drink. And the next thing I know, I'm too drunk to go over there. And I know I'm too drunk to go over there. And I'm cussing myself, and I'm, I'm saying, Tomorrow! Tomorrow I'm going to get up and I'm, going to, I'm not going to drink tomorrow and I'm going to go see my dad. And you know something? I never did go see my father. And, if you, and I'm telling you, it wasn't because I didn't love my dad. Alcoholism does that kind of thing. And thank, thank God it was not in the cards that he, he died at that time. He didn't die until I, I was sober a few years and I got to make amends to him. And, but that's what alcoholism does to guys like me. And I'm in this county jail, and there's nobody to call, and I don't know what else to do. So I go, I sign up on this sheet, and I go to an, one of those A&A meetings, you know. And I, I'm not going for recovery. You've got to understand, I, I don't think AA's got anything for me. I, by this time, I've probably been to 100 or more, somewhere between 100 and 200 AA meetings in different institutions. And I came to a conclusion after a few years of being exposed to you that whatever's wrong with me is not the same thing that's wrong with you. Because I listen to you and I watch you. When you stop drinking, you're wonderful for God's sakes. I stop drinking. I'm restless, irritable, discontent. I don't fit anywhere. I get low-level depressions. I just get my emotions, my the past and the guilt and the fear of the future just kind of on me and I can't get it off. And I know I'm not like you. I don't know what's wrong with me. I've been to a lot of therapists. They can't seem to put their finger on anything that's a home run. I've tried every... I've, been, I've, been, I've even was regressed back into my childhood by, by a hypnotherapist. I tried a lot. I, pri I primal screamed for God's sakes. I did some crazy stuff. I mean, just... Oh, I just desperate, crazy things. I mean, just to, to hoping to get better, and there's no hope. And I and I don't I don't know what's wrong with me, but I know it's not what's wrong with you. We don't match. We stop drinking here, and I don't match up with you. So I'm not going to this AA meeting for any kind of recovery. I'm going there for cigarettes, really. And I go into the 
wait for the do-gooders from AA to come in. There's a guy named Woody leading the pack, and Woody was from Aliquippa, and I, I knew Woody. Woody was, I, I didn't like Woody. Woody was one of those guys that's happy and sober at the same time, for God's <laughs> sakes. Woody had a great life, and it seemed like he enjoyed rubbing my face in it. You know, I just, he was grateful for everything. He loved everybody. He had always carrying the big book and talking about God and the steps and all that stuff. And not my kind of guy. Here he comes, and I'm embarrassed to see him. I was always felt ashamed of myself after I'd slip. You know, I'd see those people, and I always felt ashamed of myself, as if I didn't tow the bar. Because I'm still of a delusion that I should have been able to stay sober, as if I had the power. I never had the power to begin with. I'm beating myself up for something that I wasn't even qualified to be in the game for. And I go up to Woody, and I... I start talking to him, and you know those people in A, they say they want to help you. And I got, he's, I got around to explaining to him that I really needed him to put his house up so I could get out on bail. And he's, Woody had a lot of money, big house, new Cadillac. And these guys in AA, they say they want to help you until you explain it to them. And then they don't want to go. He wants to give me a, get me a big book and help me with some stairs or something. I don't want to do any of that. I want out of here. I don't, want, I don't want this stuff. I want out of here. I mean, if I got my life together, I might do AA, but I, just, I got important stuff here going on. And Woody won't help me. And he, he's, I'm, now I'm, I'm mad. But I don't say nothing to him. I just kind of hide behind some bluster. I say, I'm gonna, I don't need your help. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to beat this. And I told him, big thing back in those days was this voc rehab money that everybody would talk, in all the halfway houses, they all talk about getting this vocational rehabilitation money for, for alcoholism from the government, and then you could go to college, right? And I told him, I said, I'm going to get some voc rehab money. I'm, I might be a doctor. I might be a lawyer. And he starts laughing at me, right? And, and he says to me, he says, kid, you're not going to do any of that. He said, kid, you're not even going to stay sober. You're probably going to die of alcoholism because you haven't hit a bottom, kid. You haven't surrendered. And I didn't say nothing to him. I just went in that meeting and sat there just angry, talking to him in my head. Do you ever just sit there and talk to somebody? And It's like thinking at them. Just <laughs> What I'm thinking is, I'm thinking, that how, you know, what a, what a terrible thing to say. How dare he say that to me, having hit a bottom? He doesn't know anything about me. Him with his big house and his job at the steel mill and the Cadillac. I live like an animal. Haven't hit a bottom. <sighs> Haven't surrendered. Surrendered what? There's nothing left. There's, I have no self-respect. I, I have no material things. I have, I have nothing. There's nothing of any value inside me anymore or outside me. There's nothing. I don't know what he's talking about. I know exactly what he was talking about today. I, didn't, I really connected the dots in my early sobriety they brought a guy named Chuck Chamberlain up. They used to bring him up about once a year to talk at our inner group. And I heard Chuck talk, and all of a sudden I started to connect the dots. He talked about surrender. And I started to realize what had happened to me and why I, all of a sudden something was changing in my life. I was dying. What Woody saw when he looked at me, he saw a guy that couldn't give up the one thing, and that was his judgment and opinion of his own life. What Woody saw was really the same thing I've seen weekly for 29 years in the detoxes I go to in those places what he saw a guy who was dying of alcoholism and yet insisting on being at the wheel of his own ship I couldn't give up the wheel I couldn't listen I fit the old adage you can always tell an alcoholic but you can't tell him much you know that thing that, that William James said really fit me pretty good that that that, the, that guys like me have an inability to listen to hear anything new. We can only listen to see how we're already right. right. And that was the way I was. You couldn't get through to me. I was so full of myself and my opinions and my judgments of things that nothing could get through. I went before a judge who sentenced me to two years in a state penitentiary and then stayed the commitment. He cut me a break and 
He told me that if I could go into this place called the Ark House, and it was the only place that would take me. I'd been in every other place. And if I could stay there a year and I got good UAs and good PO report and made the restitution and did all that, uh, I, he would take a look at the case. And if I did all that and was doing good, it would stay a misdemeanor time served and I'd be done. If not, it was a felony and it was two years in a state penitentiary. So I went into this ARC house with a determination. I mean, this time, I know I see, said I was serious the last 50 times, but this time I really mean it kind of thing, you know. But, you know, I'm the guy that it talks about in the big book. Lack of power is my dilemma. There comes a time when I have no mental defense against the first drink. There comes a time when I need my yearning for the effect of about five shots of tequila overpowers any reality of how it's turned on me. The hope of feeling better is all I can see. And that happened to me after a while in that place, and I just, I went on my, what ended up being, I didn't know, my last drunk, and on that drunk, I, I tried to kill myself. I, I went to a bridge down in Pittsburgh with a bottle of wine, trying to get up enough courage to just stop it. And, you know, one of the things that brought me to this, this bridge is there was a doctor in a treatment center the previous year who said something, this guy, Dr. Torsky, said something to me that just, it should have been good news, but it was bad news. He said, he said, kid, he says, you're young enough and healthy enough. Oh, you could go on like this for five or ten more years. I'm on that bridge because that ain't going to happen. And I'm on that bridge because I finally know the truth. I know how the reality of the patheticness of my drinking. I know that all hope is gone now of me jump-starting the party and getting back to the good old days. I see the truth now, and it's horrible. And yet at the same time, I can't imagine life without it either. I am in a trap I can't spring. And I'm not a suicidal guy, but you put me in a place where, where drinking is awful and not drinking is awful, suicide starts looking like a good deal to me. And I don't get that AA has an answer for me. And you know something, over the years, I, I've, I've talked to, oh God, hundreds and hundreds of new guys. You know something, I, I have never met anyone yet that comes to AA, looks at everything we do here, the steps and the sponsorship and everything. I've never looked, seen one person yet that looks at all that and goes, Oh, yeah, that would work. <laughs> Nobody. And, and, and I think the common experience is you don't get that it works until after you're doing it for a while and all of a sudden stuff starts to change. And so I don't do anything. In 1978, uh, I'm on this bridge trying to kill myself because I'm hopeless. There's no hope that I can fix me into the kind of guy that's going to be comfortable without alcohol so I could maintain any kind of life without it. And there's no hope that I can roll it back to the good days and jumpstart the party. And I feel like there's nowhere to go, and I ain't going on like this. But I'm a coward, and sometimes you're, when it comes to alcoholism, your liabilities get to be your assets, and your assets get to be your liabilities. And one of the things I hated and deplored about myself all my life was that I was a coward. I, I put up a good front sometimes, but I always knew I was afraid inside. I, I had a, like a ball of jelly inside of me that I was weak. And I, it saved my life. A stronger guy would have killed himself. But I couldn't do it. And I broke down on that bridge and started sobbing and cursing myself. M messed my hand up slamming it on this piece of metal on that bridge for cussing myself out. And little did I know that that was my last drunk. Little did I know that I would end up about 2,500 miles away in a detox in Las Vegas, Nevada. Uh, I was trying to get to California, um, and I couldn't. That's as far as I could get. I was so sick by the time. I, what happens to me... I drink for oblivion, and when you drink for oblivion, and you drink, you drink, pass out, come to, drink, pass out, come to, you do that for a while, you get real sick after a while. I get to that point where I can't even hold it down anymore. Now it's scary because I need to hold it down, and I can't, and it's, it's time for a hospital. And I ended up in this hospital, and uh, I was so, after they cleaned me up and got me stabilized, they had the IVs in me and everything, they allowed me to go to the AA meetings there. 
And I had, I went to these meetings and for the first time in seven or seven and a half years, I could hear the people. I didn't know. I, I, it took me a while to piece together what the difference was. I thought maybe all of a sudden, I thought maybe the people in Las Vegas were brilliant and the people in Pennsylvania were dumb or something. <laughs> what I think what really happened objectively is I finally was demoralized enough. I had enough of me kicked out of me that I could finally hear you. You know that thing in your head that, that does the little critique while you listen to people? You, you know that little voice that just that goes, well, boy, is he sure full of himself. And, you know, you're right, the, the stuff that prevents anything from getting in, it was like kicked out of me. And in my demoralized, demoralized state, I sat there and I could hear people, and I remember sitting there nodding my head, and I listened to these men. That most of them have passed away. So one of them is still around, Dick, Dick T. He's, I talk to him and see him pretty regularly. He's still around. He's 44 years sober. And I listened to these guys tell their stories, and I sat there, and I thought, oh, my God, I'm like them. And out of that came a, a little bit of hope, and the little bit of hope was if I really am like these people, Maybe if I did everything that they did, could what happened to them happen to me? And I was at that place where I had nothing to lose. I, I had no nothing. It wasn't like I had a full dance card and going to AA was going to interfere with my busy life. I mean, I had nothing. I was finally at the point it talks about in our book where it says we, we came to believe in the hopelessness and futility of our life as we'd been living it. So now when we're approached by those in whom the problem had been solved, there's nothing left but to pick up the simple kit of spiritual tools they're trying to lay at my feet. They've been trying to lay it at my feet for seven years, and I'm kicking it out of the way to get to what I want. This time I just started saying yes. They said, when you get out of here, we want you to come here and here and here. And I went, okay, and I went. And I showed up where they asked me to show up. Guys, I got this guy to be my first sponsor. He told me to call him. I started calling him. Uh, I just said yes to it. I went out to coffee with them. They started spoon-feeding me AA. They told, I was brand new, and they told me to start doing 12-step work. I had to start coming back into the meetings and the detox I was in. They got me hooked up and cleared to go into the state prison. I wasn't, you couldn't even do that today. Today I would have been too new. They would, I wouldn't have fit the requirements. I'm grandfather, I've been grandfathered in at the state penitentiary for almost 29 years. I've been there since before they had the regulations to get in that you have to have today. Uh, and I just, I just went along. I would protest a little bit. You know, I'd, say, you know, I'd always quite because they, they told me a lot of things that didn't make any sense. To, and they never respected my opinion. They just, <laughs> just do it. Just do it. And I started doing it. And things started to change in my life. I uh, I got to make amends to my parents. I didn't want to. I, I When the people in the AA started pushing me to do that, I tried to talk them out of it. I tried to tell them it's too late. I've done too much damage. A couple years ago, I could have done this. It's too late. And they never cared. They just told me what to do. They had me call. my mo- They said, you got to call your mother every week. Don't call collect. It blew her mind the first time I did that. She thought I was in Pennsylvania. Got, she got scared. She thought I was back in town again. Oh, man. <laughs> I said, no, I'm in Nevada. She said, the operator didn't come on and ask for me to pay for the call. I said, no, Mom, I paid for the call. Her voice went up an octave. She went, you paid for the call? She couldn't believe it. It was, uh, it was so out of character for me. And you guys walked me through uh, being a son. I didn't know anything about that. I didn't know anything about being an employee. I didn't know how to go to work. It was all about me. When I was maybe 60 days sober, I'm I'm in a panic attack because I'm facing two years in a state penitentiary. And I know it's just, I I get this anxiety. I go to this old guy in AA and I start telling him about it. I don't really want to do anything about it. I'd been in enough treatment, I thought, if you just talk about it. I don't want to do enough, just talk about it. Maybe feel, talk out, talk it out, talk it out. And the guy, I'm telling him about it, and he starts pushing me to take some action on this stuff. And I, he's telling me that I have to contact my PO in Pennsylvania and the courts and offer to come back there, if necessary, and do the two years. 
And I'm thinking, what are you, crazy? Hey, I'm going to meetings. I'm sober here. Isn't this good enough? He says, you've got to do that, kid. I said, no, I don't. It's, that's crazy. He says, you want to stay sober? Yeah. He says, you want to die of alcoholism? No. He said, listen, how long are you going to be able to stay sober looking over your shoulder? Every time you see a cop car go down the street, your gut just goes like that. How long are you going to be able to do, do that where you can't even use a social security number to go to work? How long are you going to exist like that until that anxiety is going to push you to pick up a drink or take something or do something? How long are you going to be able to go, kid? And I knew he was right. He's talking. He knows these people. They, it seemed like they knew me better than I knew me. And he's explaining me to me. You'd think I could explain me to me better than he could. He's explaining me to be, me to me better than I can explain me to me. And I knew he was right. And he walked me through it. He had had me write this letter to my PO. He made me put the address of the halfway house I was living in. I thought that's a bad idea. <laughs> I didn't want him to know where I was. He said, you have to tell him where you are. And he said, tell your PO you're going to call him, give him 10 days, give him a time and a day. And I remember sending the letter out. I remember dropping it in the mailbox and then try, it just like a reflex, trying to get my arm in there to get it back. It was just automatic. And I, so my head blew up. I thought, oh my God, what have I done? This is what a mistake. This guy's never been to prison. What am I listening to him for? And I'm ready to bolt. And they told me, they said, you can't. You'll drink again if you run. And I made it through the longest ten days of my life. Every, I couldn't sleep. I couldn't. I, it was just awful. And the time came when I said on the letter I would call him. And I called. And this woman answers the phone. And she says, uh, he's expecting your call. And they put me through to him. And he gets on the phone. And he says, I've talked to my supervisor. And we've talked to the courts. You don't have to come back here. But here's what you have to do. And he gave me a whole list of things. I had to go to these classes at a place called CRS, Court Referral Services, where they had these drunk driving classes. I had to report to a guy. He said, you might have to give, you have UAs. You might have, he said, you're going to have to send us money. You got, you got, you're going to have to clear this up. And you're going to, he gave me this whole list of things. And he said, it's, if you do all that, the case will be transferred to Nevada. It'll stay a misdemeanor. But if you don't do that, they're going to have the ability to to revoke it, to, I don't know what, it'll probably go back to a felony. And everything he gave me to do was stuff I could do. And I remember walking away from that phone call feeling like I'd just had, better than like five shots of tequila when tequila really worked. It was like I felt this lightness and this freeness inside of me. And it was like a postcard from... A God that I don't even believe in. And it said, God, Bob, we got your back. And it was the first thing I've ever done in my life that was against everything I felt and thought. It was the first time I was ever surrendered enough to listen to someone else's direction. Where everything in me wanted to bolt. And I guess it was the first place I started, the act, first actions I ever took that allowed me just a little bit to start trusting in Alcoholics Anonymous and whatever the power is that's behind the curtain here. And I, that was a very important time in my life. There may be somebody sitting in this room that you got something that you're, if you, you, don't, you haven't told your sponsor because you know what he's going to say. And so you're, you're sweeping it under the rug and it ain't going nowhere. Trust. You've been trusted in yourself and your own thinking and your own judgment for a lot of years. I think the key question at this point is, how's that been working? Sometimes you get to a point where you have nothing left to lose. I think it got down to the point with, with me where I was willing to have anybody direct my life other than me. I, I have a... <laughs> I told this guy years ago, and it's really true. I said, uh, he's exactly like me. And I said, listen, you don't want to take direction from anybody, and yet you would be better off taking direction from Charles Manson than from yourself. I mean, I mean when, you, when you think about it objectively, if you would have watched me as my family did for a few years, and, or, or maybe as your family watched you the last couple years, 
you would easily come to the conclusion whoever's making decisions for this guy is out to kill him. And yet inside of me, I justify and rationalize every position I take. And in 1978, I guess I surrendered or tried to surrender to the best of my ability, and I continue to try to surrender that judgment. I've been sober long enough to know one thing for sure. I'm wrong a lot. And there is a freedom in being wrong, and there's a, there's a, a prison cell in needing to be right. And I'm, I am glad that I know that I'm wrong a lot today. If you're new, uh, I want to welcome you to Alcoholics Anonymous. I'll tell you a quick little story and I'll end. Um, I was up in Northern California on the Oregon border uh, maybe 17 years ago for a monthly, some kind of monthly AA thing. And there was a guy there that was showing me around, nice guy. And he took me in his truck and we went out to see these, these trees that were like 250 feet high, 20, 25 feet in diameter, just amazing. It was like Jurassic Park, this forest. It was really an awesome place. And I'm walking around this forest and for about 20, 30 minutes, and the guy says, come on, we're going to go down to the coast and look at some of the sea rocks and stuff and cliffs and things. And We're getting in this guy's truck, and we're driving along, and we're passing these fields and meadows. And he says to me, he says, you see how there's not a 250-foot tree all by itself in the middle of a field? I said, yeah. He says, you know why that is? I said, no. Why is that? He said, well, it is their nature to aspire to grow to such magnificent heights that what happens is that they will literally outgrow their roots capacity to support themselves and they'll topple over eventually on their own aspired magnificence. What must happen in God's plan is that they must grow up in community and they intertwine their roots into a net below the floor of the forest and they literally will feed and support each other and that allows them to grow into their nature. And when he said that, I started to think about that and I started thinking that's exactly what Alcoholics Anonymous has done in my life. I have had a defect of my character that I've never, ever gotten away from and I have it to this day. There's something inside of me that has always thirsted and hungered for more, that has always wanted to take bigger bites out of life, that has always yearned for more, and that alone almost drove me to, to my own destruction. It almost killed me. And then I came to you and I intertwined the very fabric of my life with you, and I got a sponsor in a home group, and I started sponsoring guys, and intertwining the roots of my life with yours, you've allowed me to grow into my nature. And if I live to be a thousand years old, I can never repay the life that I got in Alcoholics Anonymous. Um, thank you.